Okay, great. Everybody get connected. And we can begin broadcast too. Okay. All right. Hello. Welcome everyone to the June 2nd <coughs> Portland Clean Energy Community Benefits Fund Grant Committee meeting. Um, we're going to um, start as we always do by going over just some um, kind of meeting logistics, some virtual particip a virtual participation check-in, and then I'll be handing it over to our co-chair, Maria, to do um, the opening for the meeting uh, before we move on. Um, while I'm doing, before, um, so the first thing on the virtual participation checklist, just to know, is that um, there is, in the chat box um, is a place where we want folks to um, put your information, put your name, your organizational affiliation if you want to, your gender pronouns if you want to, um, into that box so that we can introduce you after we do uh, committee and staff introductions. That's also the place where if you want to um, provide public comment, you should put that in, indicate your, that you want to do that in the chat box. And um, public comment is usually around 6.05. We started a little bit late, but um, it's still available. So just be sure and put that in the, indicate in the chat if you do want to provide public comment. These committee meetings are open to the public. Um, they are being recorded and they are also being live streamed on YouTube. We have a few breakout rooms um, in the, on the agenda today, or we have one breakout room that the public is able to sort of observe in that is on the agenda today. For folks who are, might be watching on YouTube, there's no way for them to observe those rooms on, on YouTube. So if you want to be able to do that, you'll need to enter enter the meeting through Zoom. We do ask that the public um, we observe and listen during the meetings, except in the times when, um, except in the times reserved for public comment or every other meeting we do reserve a break for the public to engage in more direct dialogue with committee members. So there will be an opportunity for that at the next June meeting, which is on June 16th. And then, of course, there are always other opportunities for engagement with the program just by reaching out directly to staff. If you have any issues during the meeting, please do just chat um, James Valdez, who is our tech lead tonight, who just waved in the box there, and um, he can try and address, answer any questions or address anything, any needs that you might have. There's closed captioning that is available in this meeting, and you can find that by going up to the, the Zoom bar and going to the three dots that say more. And then if you click on that, you'll get the little drop down menu and you can view the live transcription there. Or I guess it might be a drop up menu depending on where your Zoom, where your Zoom um, menu is. So with that, I think I will just, I didn't see anyone come in late. So hopefully everybody was able to put their information into the chat box and indicate if they wanted to provide public comment. Um, but I'd like to turn it over to our co-chair, Maria Sippen, so that she can provide an opening for the meeting. Maria? Thanks, Katie. Thanks, everyone, for joining tonight. I wanted to open today's meeting with just a reflective activity that I picked up from my Transportation Justice Fellowship. I've been gaining a lot of great skills and deep experiences as an urban planner um, in this fellowship and working with the Thrivance Group. June is a month that I started to pay a lot more attention to in recent years, um, learning all the ways that I can participate in reparative policy work um, with a specific focus on reparations and abolition in transportation. I think all of us are engaged in work that is particularly heavy and taxing. And, um, you know, we take to heart our guiding principles here at PCEF, particularly justice oriented work in clean energy. Uh, I wanted to give you all a second to reflect on what it is you bring to this work. What gifts do you bring to this sector? Um, think about when you applied to be a committee member or when you started working in clean energy related work. What 
what do you think about your impact would be? What what is something you want to continue bringing into this work moving forward? You don't need to chat it in, but if you feel compelled to, please share. Um, but just take just take this moment now while I pause to think about the gifts that you bring to the sector and why you do it. So the rest of the folks joining the room, please continue to chat into the box here, um, your affiliation, your name and your pronoun. And for my co-chair and committee members, please remember today to take care of yourself during the meeting. Um, let us know if there's any way we can better support you during our few hours together today. And, how we can help uh, better bring you into the space during our breakouts. Let us know if you need anything. And so I would just like to share um, something that I wanted to highlight in our PSF work together. Um, I joined all of you because so many community members inspired me to be part of this work. And my gift would be um, to keep helping uh, to challenge the systems that have created harm for many of our communities and to help transform that with other people. Um, hopefully my emotions and my strength and all of the things I've gained throughout the years could help me uplift this work further and to support any of you as well. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Maria. So I'm gonna start with committee member introductions and um, I'll start by just calling on you and asking you to introduce yourself as I always do and then introduce staff who are actively participating in the meeting today and then move on to members of the public and public comments. Robin. Uh, good evening, Robin Wang, our committee member, he, him. Amanda. Good evening, um, my name is Amanda Squimpignazia, I use she, her pronouns, and I am a committee member. Maria. Maria Sippen, she, they pronouns, committee member. Shanice? Shanice Clark, she, her pronouns, committee member. Faith? Hi everyone, Faith Graham, committee member, she, her pronouns. Michael? Michael Eden Hill, he, him and committee member. Francis. Hi everyone, <clears throat> uh, Ranfis uh, Genetino Viatoro, he, him. And we have, uh, Megan is gonna be a little bit late, I think around 6.45 is when she's gonna be able to join us and Jeffrey um, is not able to make it to tonight. So those are our other two committee members, um, so we'll, try and pause at a not too awkward time when Megan comes in and let her introduce herself. So um, staff who are at the meeting, um, who are actively participating, we'll start with James. Hi everybody, good to see you all. Uh, James Valdez, use he, him pronouns, member of the PSAF staff, and today is serving as your meeting tech. So if you do have any issues or need assistance, uh, go ahead and uh, chat at me. And Janet. Good evening, everybody. Janet Hammer, she, her pronouns, member of the PSAF staff, and I'll be your scribe this evening. And Jay should be joining us shortly. Jay is also gonna be helping in the um, one of the breakout rooms. We just like to only have staff whose names start with the letter J. Um, so 
I'm going to then turn it over to Sam. And Sam, if you want to introduce yourself and introduce um, the folks who put their names into the chat box, that would be great. I'm Katie Lister, piece of staff. I use she, her pronouns. Good. Hi, folks. Uh, I'm feeling the energy is a little lower today, and I don't know if that's the heat, but but hopefully we'll, we'll give you some stuff that maybe. You... But anyways, I just want to say it's good to be here with you all. Sam Barroso, he, him, he says staff. And we've got a handful of folks um, with us this evening. We've got Anissa Pemberton, they, them, with the Coalition of Communities of Color. Um, we've got Jenny Hall, she, her, with Energy Trust of Oregon Solar Program. We've got Angela Previdelli, he says staff, she, her. We've got Martina. And apologies if I mispronounce this, uh, Steinkus, Steinkus, uh, with the King Neighborhood Association public member. Um, and I think that is it. And we did just have um, our, our teammate, Jay Richman, also join. Yeah, and it looks like um, Anissa Pemberton did sign up for public comment. And so I'm going to ask Anissa to come on screen and provide that now. Hi, everyone. If you want to come on screen. Oh, there you are. Yeah, Good. I'm here. Hey. <laughs> My name is Anissa Pemberton. I use they, them pronouns, and I work for the Coalition of Communities of Color. I wanted to begin by thanking all of the grant committee members for your continued hard work and dedication in ensuring that the Portland Clean Energy Fund is implemented in a justice-driven, accountable, and community-driven manner. I'm joining you all tonight on behalf of the PSEF Coalition to share with you briefly some thoughts about the innovation funding option. When our coalition was writing the PSEF ballot measure, we recognized pretty quickly that we were not going to be able to include transportation in the PSEF ballot measure directly. Um, the intention of including an innovation category was to allow the community to surface ideas um, that could innovate on different sectors that were not directly included in the ballot measure. Um, so recently, the PSEF Coalition, we've been exploring possible options for transportation justice policy. And as we've continued to explore these concepts, we've consistently run into the same barriers that prohibited the coalition from directly including transportation in the ballot measure. So primarily, these barriers are jurisdictional. So for example, what jurisdictions on what roads? How do we reach out or southeast? How do we ensure accessibility is prioritized? And what is the role of existing transportation bureaus and bodies? And so we know that transportation is a leading source of greenhouse gases in the city of Portland. And we understand that low-income communities are adversely affected by pollution, lack of accessibility and expense. And so ultimately we think that addressing the transportation issue will require a significant investment. Um, into the innovative infrastructure that needs to be built by and for frontline communities. So we understand that the grant committee is considering a cap of $500,000 um, on the PSEF innovation funds. And so we're asking if you'd consider having at least one available grant of up to $1.5 million that addresses the transportation disparities and offers an opportunity to transform the transportation sector more holistically. Um, so thanks for considering this idea. And please feel, reach, feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to talk about this more. Um, sadly, I have to take off right away, <laughs> friend coming over, but um, I'm really happy to hear from anybody, uh, staff or grant committee members. So thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you, Anissa. All right. I don't think that anybody else signed up for public comment. Um, because that what we only had one person who signed up for public comment, I did want to offer the committee if, if there was an option, um, because I feel like there's a little bit of time if you had any kind of like comments or clarifying questions or anything like that related to the public comment that Anissa provided, um, because this is a topic that we're going to be talking about tonight. And even though she said she has to leave, I still see her name there. So I assume that or I assume that I assume that they are are still available. Are there any comments or questions? 10 minutes or so, that's what Anissa said. Michael, I see you unmuted yourself. I did unmute myself. I have my little hand up here. Um, anyway, I was, uh, I was wondering if Maria, 
as our transportation specialist had anything to add to and what and 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 um and it's uh, also sort of what what are some of the transportation um investments that you were like that were kind of thought about at the 1.5 million level Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's been some exploration into e-bikes. It's still very much in its um, early stages of conversations though. Um, yeah. Francis? Just a clarification on the transportation question. Is it limited? Maybe you already said this and I missed this. Um, is this just limited to like transportation, like electrification, or is it broader sort of transportation, like thinking of all the ways that transportation um, impacts our lives? I just kind of, sorry, want to yeah. clarify that. Yeah, so broadly the Peace of Coalition has been looking into more holistic um, aspects of the transportation system. To be honest, there's not a lot of local solutions on the city level that we can enact. It would probably need to be a statewide um, topic, but we have been talking about possible programming to increase access to electric vehicles, e-bikes, those sort of options. Thank you. All right, thank you. Oh, I see Faith's hand being raised in the fuzzy background. Faith, and then Maria. Um, yeah. Sorry for the fuzzy background, Mesa. Thank you so much for that uh, public comment. I'm curious where I didn't. I had no idea why transportation wasn't in the original um, language, um, and I've been asked about that several times. So there's obviously a, there's a correlation that people see. Um, is there somewhere I can go that helps me understand, or maybe it's a phone call with you at some point that just helps me understand what are the like you you said it was kind of jurisdictional issues. Um, and so and, and it doesn't feel like we would have those same jurisdictional issues of making a grant. Um, it would only, I would assume it was just the specification in the law that was the issue. Yeah, so if we were to have a transportation justice policy that would have funds available, um, you'd run into a ton of, if you don't do it on a statewide level, you'd run into a ton of jurisdictional issues in terms of who owns what roads, what roads mm -hmm. did. And so that was the main reason it got left out of the bill. Um, but I'm happy to connect you with our policy advisor, Lenny, mm -hmm. who is way more of an expert on this topic than I am. Um, and he was part of drafting the original PSAF ballot mm -hmm. measure. So he, he's, pretty, he's pretty in the know about the context. Uh, can I follow up? And that he's not concerned about us using the innovation bus protection project. Okay, no. thank you. No. Maria? Michael, I heard you tag my name there. I think it's interesting to be able to talk about transportation and this clean energy work as we know that transportation um, is the largest um, generator of greenhouse gas emissions in the country. Um, one of the tough challenges that I need to mention is having all of these jurisdictional um, barriers. And I think transportation is one of those sectors that have not been led by community in, 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 like in any shape or form. Um, but now folks are pushing for that. I think it'd be interesting to see um, what types of programs or projects um, would emerge that are big winners for community members right now. I know the Portland region has been clamoring about uh, different ways to make public transit accessible or fare-free um, and lots of organizing going towards um, challenging the types of infrastructure that we build. So I, I think it'd be great to watch um, what things emerge, um, but I know Portland has some good ideas already. Um, just before I take off, I just want to repeat the offer if things, I know sometimes people process things slower. So if you want to reach out again, um, feel free to, I'll put my email in the chat. 
thank you, Anissa, and thank you so much for being gracious um, and letting us put you on the spot like that. Um, so really appreciate it, always. All right, and have a good dinner. So I, next, we will move on to the agenda. And I just, um, sorry, my computer is set up a little bit differently now, and I'm, it's confusing me. But now we're moved on to the agenda. OK. Um, so we uh, got through public comment. The next thing on the agenda is um, Sam is going to do a fair amount of the presenting tonight. There's the, Sam's going to talk about timeline and a path forward, we're going to move into a more involved conversation about a sort of returning to the minimum scores and the threshold review. Um, we will kind of like offer the opportunity because that's a pretty long conversation. I know Sam said the energy was low and I know it's pretty hot. We might be need to do a like get up and get a glass of ice water break um, at some point. But so if in that lot, if at any point folks feel like the conversation would really benefit from being broken up a little bit more. I do think there is always an opportunity for that, right? Like if you have, as committee members feel like this full committee space is a little bit too much and too much sort of having to raise hand and not conversational enough between you, then you can, um, I think that Sam referred to it earlier as calling an audible. You can just let us know that you want to go into breakout rooms. You don't have to wait until we have sort of when they have, we have them scheduled. But we do have two breaks scheduled in tonight's meeting. One of them is sort of another for you guys to get to know each other. And then there's one that the public can observe in and where the, that is in the discussion about the innovation slash other funding category. Um, so before I hand it over to Sam, I would like to ask, I know we sent material out pretty late last night, but um, just if folks did have the opportunity to review the minutes that were sent out and um, maybe, yeah, and if they did, if there was, uh, if, if there were any edits, corrections, comments, or suggestions, or just let me know if you didn't have a chance and we'll, we'll approve them next meeting. Faith? Yeah, thanks. It's always really awkward in these meetings to say I didn't have a chance to review them. Um, so I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if we just had a show of hands of uh, people who had the chance to review them, because that would be helpful. I also have a comment, because I, I was able to jump on a few minutes early and review them. Um, so okay. let's start with a show of hands, maybe. Oh, well, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm, hands, I'm seeing some go up. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Awesome. Um, okay. So it looks so like, it looks like it we looks have like enough there's that we a couple approved. who did not. Yeah, one, two, three. Well, there's four that reviewed and um, and a couple that did not. So I think maybe we should just wait until next week to review, but I would absolutely take a comment now because we could correct it before next week. Yeah, and it's actually not a correction, but it might help others too. I um, I was surprised that the breakouts were kind of transcribed, um, and I think it's totally fine. But I think it, it was helpful for me to know that that was going to happen. So for because sometimes you know it feels really different in a breakout than it feels in the main room. So just an acknowledgement to folks that all of this stuff is public, which is fair and helpful but even when you're in a breakout. All right. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks, Faith. Okay, so we're going to not approve the minutes. We're going to um, bump that to next week and where we, will, we won't send them out at 11 o'clock the night before the meeting. So now I am going to turn it over to Sam. Sam, if you're ready to jump into the, um, into the timeline conversation. And just to, I, maybe just one more thing before we go there is that we are, I mean, I, I think that it was valuable to have that conversation with Anissa, particularly given the, the topic tonight. So I'm glad that, you know, they were on and able to provide public comment and, and have that dialogue. Our, um, we are now a little bit kind of behind in the schedule, um, but we'll just kind of, we'll, we'll see where we get. And, um, but in any event, take a break at 710. 
All right, good. Sam, all yours. Thank you, Katie. What I'm going to do is, I, I realize, Katie, as I was looking at this, that as we talk about the timeline, you know, in a second, I'm going to ask Katie for you to jump a couple slides ahead so that we can really talk about how we get from, from here there as opposed to jumping right back in the timeline. Then we'll go back and look at that. But I know that as we've been getting a lot of this information from you all, and I think part of this is that we just have to acknowledge we're still learning. I mean, despite this being now our second year of doing this, it's still a, it's still a process for us as well. And so what we've really been seeking through all of this, and I just want to be really more clear, is in each of these meetings, we're going to continue to present content to you all. And as, I, as we present that content, our hope and our objective is that we get, we get all your thoughts, your feelings, your feedback, other, other things you need to know in order to feel like you have a better sense for that. And not that we're always going to be able to get that. Oftentimes, we sometimes can tell you we don't have that information. But with the expectation that as we talk about minimum scores, thresholds, grant caps, the review process, the evaluation findings, that for us, it's really important we get feedback in each of these sessions because it really helps how we craft each of these pieces into a broader RFP, recognizing that we're not expecting a decision from you all on just the minimum scores, for instance, in part because there's an interaction and a relationship with minimum scores the threshold review, the grant cap, and other pieces. And so it's really important as we go through here that you're all probably thinking, what are we looking from you all in each of these meetings? And we really want to just hear what are feelings coming up for you all? What are thoughts that you have? What are concerns? So that we can keep capturing those with the expectation that when we bring it all together and kind of try to wrap it up more neatly in, in what we what will, the, the, the request for proposals that we'll put out for public comment, that that will be a place where we'll explain how we took each of that feedback and how we brought it together more neatly. Um, and so um, you can go now a couple slides. That really was what I wanted to share here. Um, I think just two slides up, Katie. Um, so that's that's really what we're, we're doing is we're, we're, we're identifying those topics. And we'll jump back to the next slide to go through what are remaining topics that we'll chat about, but is to get, to get your feedback. But we won't, I just want to be clear because I think sometimes I know that's not clear and I really want to more clearly say it. And I think we're going to continue to remind folks this in each of the conversations that we want to hear from you all what else you want to learn about? What are the concerns that are coming up in each of these topics? What are additional topics you want to be discussing that, that folks are going to need to that are, are going to want to going to want to discuss with the expectation that the decision points where we're going to try to bring them together will be one before we release the RFP for public comment. We're going to say now we've pulled this all together. We're still we're still trying to we still need to collectively hear additional feedback now on sort of the whole. And so we'll ask for you all for your approval to go out for public comment. And then when we bring that comment back for you all, when folks have really been able to look at the, the whole, we'll, we'll bring that back to you all with suggested revisions in response to that feedback and ask for you all for your second decision. So those are really the decision points, but leading up to there, we want to hear, we just want to continue hearing your feedback. So for us, these conversations have been really helpful, but I know at times that's been a question mark for, and we know that we've heard that it's been a question mark of what are we looking for you all? And I think you're giving us exactly what, what, we, what we've been wanting, but I want to make sure you understand that's what that's how we've been looking at it. So before I, I have a list now, we're going to go back and list the topics. Before I do that, maybe just just the folks have questions about what I've just shared or what I would have would have spoken to around um, getting from here to, to the release of the draft uh, request for proposals for public comment, and then subsequently getting your final approval to, to release the RFP for folks to put together and pull together their wildest dreams and ideas. I have a question. Sorry, I can't find my raised hand button. Um, how, how do we introduce our, our feedback and thoughts on, on matters that might be outside of the things that you're 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 considering, right? So we're talking about um, uh, you know caps. We're talking about you know kind of different concepts of of the the, the RFP process. But you know, what if we wanted to talk about you know, something like the phase of the moon and how that might affect you know the application process? That's obviously not on your radar for for talking. How do we how do we introduce that if, if if we feel that that's at least worth considering. Does that make sense? I, I, I 
totally, totally, Robin. It makes it may, certainly makes sense to me. I, I think, well, maybe not the face of the moon specifically, but but but, <laughs> um, but I, I think you know I'd like to you know you've got your co-chairs and Michael Maria and you know I think that's that's at least a, a first place, this one place certainly to to introduce whether and then to introduce topics or just have that initial discussion and then at likewise staff and I think what we like to do first is just to, you know always try to understand the issue and figure out whether that's something that you know whether it's already there's already sort of a placeholder for that because we're obviously going to bring together some of the evaluation findings which I'll share just that timeline in, in the previous slide but I think um, really knowing that that, that that you know we're meeting every other every, right after each of our committees with committee meetings with Michael and Maria that, that those are two points that you can bring folks two places where you can bring your feedback to on other topics as well as myself or Katie. And then, and, and, and part of that is just to give us the, I, I think, give us the, 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 the room to say, okay, where do we place this? You know, is this something we already have a response to? Is this already something we're going to bring up in some other context or does this need to be a topic that we actually elevate because it's, 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 it's more, it, it doesn't, it doesn't have a new place or a new home. Katie, Katie, others chime in if I've, if I've and I, I want to make sure I'm not also mis misunderstanding anything here. But Robin, does that feel like that gets at what you're? Oh, Maria. Yeah. Robin, that's a good question. I think we can start to exercise more of our ability to add agenda items for discussion uh, and to exercise our use of the breakout rooms if you think that's like an appropriate forum where we can pitch a question to the group and we can have that dialogue in those spaces. So I'm not sure if today would be a good time to, to add that into the breakouts we have or if we, if we do have time to do that, we should talk about whatever you have in mind. Uh, well, we can certainly save it for the meeting we have mid-month. Grand piece. Sorry, I don't have much to add. I just uh, kind of just want to remind folks as, as we like go into these topics, it, it'll be helpful to be reminded of what are the problems we're trying to fix um, through each stage of this because it helps it sort of form the kind of feedback that we want. I think we're all solutions oriented people, but I think if we're offering solutions that, that's not getting to the root of the issue that we're trying to address, um, you know, I think so. I just want to just as, as we go into like minimum scoring or threshold like that we're talking about what's the root problem that we're trying to fix so that we're we know what we're, what we're trying to provide us to or all offer an alternative so just want to just kind of a friendly reminder and i think it relates to future topics thank you thank, thank you Okay, then I'm going to ask Kate if you can jump back one slide and then we can get a preview of just some of those topics and the timeline. So today we're, you know, at the, at the top of the box, although we've already had several meetings, we're going to continue discussing minimum scores, threshold review, as well as the innovation or other funding category funding area. Um, then in our next meeting, we've got teed up for you all, at least a presentation from our anti-displacement team at the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. And we hope to talk, start talking also about the, the to talk about just that, that element, the anti-displacement, but also then to start talking about workforce training and contractor support grants um, and, and some of the key issues that came up there around um, potentially defining allocations and really thinking more about more about sort of um, training for workplace for for you know a workforce that's ready to enter the workforce versus training upstream and, and, and doing more leadership development or youth education, youth training. Um, I'm going to pause Did there. you see that Rand Peace had his hand up? Hey, sorry, Sam. Uh, uh, didn't mean to cut you off there. Just kind of curious, um, since you mentioned sort of the discussion on anti-displacement next week and um, that part of the program being um, uh, with folks on the BPS team. Will there be an inclusion of any community group in, to be paired on that discussion? Just kind of curious, because I, I just want to you know, I do appreciate hearing like agencies' perspective on things like related to housing and displacement and renewables. It's always, I think, um, 
it's great to sort of get a check or a balance uh, from a perspective from a, from a community group. So I'm just kind of curious um, if that's going to be considered as well or in the future. Ram, because I'll answer at the moment, no, but it's, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great point. So um, let us follow back up with the, the, the staff at, um, on the anti-displacement team at the, at the plan, in the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. And we'll, we'll follow back up with them and just see sort of both because they, they, they clearly did this, this work is in close collaboration with, with community partners. And so we can, we'll check in and see, um, we'll check in and follow up and, and, and see where it can go. And, and, um, but I'm hearing that request and maybe um, after I follow up, we'll be able to just check in Michael and Maria and see sort of where we get and we can, we can workshop those in there. Because I'm happy to also give you a call and let you know sort of the outcome of that conversation um, to see sort of where we go and bring some of that feedback to you. Thanks, Sam. And yeah, I'll just add, like, it was really helpful to hear, um, you know, last year as we did a, sorry, might be blanking on the timelines because what is time now, but it was helpful when we had done sort of a presentation on workforce uh, in the past and not just hear from, say, uh, Bully or the apprenticeship training program, uh, sort of, sorry, their, uh, their uh, sort of apprenticeship department, but to hear it from pre-apprenticeship groups and contractor uh, interest groups as well, talking about workforce development. So I just wanted to just highlight that how important, what, how helpful it was or informative it was to hear from multiple um, stakeholders on, on a given topic. Okay. okay, thank you. So then, so, so then the subsequent in, in the July meeting, we've got at least slated would be, um, you know, picking up the conversation around land building and acquisition and this is seeking so just more clarity that I think that that, that we're, we're going to need to provide for applicants this next round, particularly given the scale of funding that will be going out um, around both acquiring land as well as uh, acquiring buildings. And then we'll use that meeting to ideally come back to grant caps at that point and, and start and, and pick up the conversation there. And I'll pause here because I, I know we just got a, an additional a, an addition of the meeting. All right. Megan, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi everybody, uh, Megan Horst, she, her committee member. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, thanks Megan. And so um, the, next, um, the next meeting on July 21st, and we're working pretty feverishly to bring this to you all, is in a, a, the evaluation findings, both uh, including recommended improvements through a, 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 a substantial body of work that, um, that that Janet, a body of interns, have been working on, um, as well as staff, and in connecting with um, applicants, application support grant applicants, as well as applicants from the last round, in order to tease out what worked well, what didn't, and so as well as feedback from you all as, and staff and other scoring panelists. So we'll bring that. Our plan is to bring that to you all on July 21st, and that that that, that follows um, after we've had com um, community conversations as well around some of that feedback. Um, and then ultimately, we want to come to you all August 4th with something pulled together and leading up to that, having just having having previewed some of um, the the package of that RFP. But on August 4th, coming to you all with that full RFP um, with the idea that we seek an approval for you all to release that for public comment. So we push that off for public comment um, potentially on August 18th. We don't have anything necessarily scheduled then, but that could be another in the same way we did it last year, a, a listening session that, that we offer folks a direct opportunity to directly comment directly to the committee and make that a potential listening session for you all. And then wrapping up that public comment and bringing back um, a, a review of that public comment as well as recommended changes to the final RFP in September, on September 1st, could be a potential decision point there with the goal of giving us a few weeks after that to release the RFP. So we're now uh, as you see, things have already shifted, and it's just the reality of what happens. But right now, that puts us to um, September 22nd is sort of our target goal if we're working back from that date to release RFP number two. And, and, and to give you a sense for how that compared last go around, and it's going to really put us on that cycle, we, we released the last RFP on September 16th, so just a, a little bit after that. So um, that's, that gives you just a sense for And we're going to keep bringing this up each meeting so folks can just start, start to inter, in, internalize this and see where we're going and tracking where we're at. Um, but I um, wanted, to, wanted to share that and, and know that there's going to be other little topics that are going to come up in here and, and we'll, we'll make adjustments as, as we need to.
any comments or thoughts before we move on to the next part of the presentation? All right, you ready, Sam? Yes, absolutely. And, and, and what I'll just say is maybe I'm not, not necessarily just a fill it. There, there's a whole lot that's going to come through the evaluation findings, and certainly many of those things are a lot of a lot of different tweaks, adjustments, different ways in which we're asking questions, um, a whole host of things. So there, there, there'll be a body there, and it, it, it certainly revolves around the, the structure, form, process of the application. But um, so, in, so far, uh, in, in having previewed and, and starting to dig, dig into the findings, we're, 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 feeling, we're feeling pretty good. Yeah. All right. So the ground people in this conversation around minimum scores and thresholds, which, which is a pickup of the conversation from our last meeting in mid-May. Um, and, and I'll acknowledge that this is, it's a, it sometimes can be a confusing topic, and I don't think I helped. So minimum scores and threshold review. Now, minimum scores have a single, we did not use a minimum score in, in, in the first RFP, in RFP number one. Now, a reason, in, in many sense, we talked about a minimum score. There was a discussion on having a minimum score. It ultimately was never used in many parts. It was because we we had 8.6 million of funding availability, and I think I, I think if, if if I was asking myself, is I think we knew that we would have a good, probably a robust pool of application in order to to select some good ones. But there was also probably a discomfort not knowing how projects would have scored and being able to select a minimum. Probably I think that we never pushed that conversation then, and, and yet I think it probably wasn't necessary. I think now, as we go to 60 million, you know, and to just, I've talked about this from a scale perspective, but when we go to $60 million, you know, to put it in scale, we have $30 million of funding requests for 8.6 million in funding. We know several folks sat out the round because that fund, the million dollar cap was not quite suitable for their projects, but you probably can guess that we probably saw a good amount of the demand for million dollars and million dollar less projects. And so as we go out to 60 million, it's substantially more. I mean, to put that in comparison to, I think the Portland Housing Bureau this year is gonna be releasing a notice of funding availability for $75 million. And that is the largest funding availability they've put out in a year in its history. So 60 million is a substantial amount. And, and for 60 million, I think the, the rationale around having a minimum score is that we're gonna go through our processes again, score applications, but not necessarily, we, I think that the desire is that there, there's always a potential out there to be put in a place that if we don't have projects that, that you know, projects that pass eligibility, right? There, let's say we get projects that pass the eligibility. They're, they're situated within the city of Portland coming from a nonprofit organization, but they otherwise um, do not necessarily meet the intent of the program. They meet the basic eligibility, but, but are just poor projects. I think the question is, even if we score those, do we want to be put in a position that we're that we need to that we have to fund those, and so a minimum score gives us a clear place to say, if you don't pass this minimum threshold, this project cannot be funded because X, Y, Z. And I think that's what we want to tease out. And a lot of that is because it doesn't align with the program goals. Um, and so that's really the intent of minimum score is to make sure that you all are not put in a position to fund a project, and that we've clearly stated from the outset that to fund a project that shouldn't be funded, and then. So separate from that is the threshold review. And there is an interaction because minimum scores take away projects. And so they don't necessarily, they don't necessarily get, they, they don't necessarily move on. But threshold review is, is, is something that we that, that given the expectation that we assume we're going to probably receive 200 or north of 200 applications, that in order to accommodate the, 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 the lives that you all have um, and, and, and that we want you to have, <laughs> Um, that, that, that there's, there's probably a, 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 there's a scenario that coming up with a threshold review where um, figuring out the, given the capacity you all to have to offer, what are the what is a threshold that we use in order to bring applications to you all? And what's the basis for doing that? So that's the threshold review is to account for the capacity that we have with you all, as well as potentially our community reviewers, assuming that it sounds like folks are still on board for that model. So um, just wanted to, I realized that there was confusion on that, and I really want to make sure really clear about sort of the purpose of the minimum score and the threshold review and the fact that there still is an interaction between the two of those things. And we'll, we'll have more chance to okay. answer, ask questions. Don't feel stuck here because I think we got more content. So let's, let's, let's move to the next slide. So 
these are the six scoring sections that we want you all to be thinking about as we, and we're going to continue to come back to this as we think about the minimum score and how you might actually apply a minimum score, whether ultimately you apply it to the overall application, whether you apply it to specific sections of the application um, or, or, or some other, some other way. But we highlight three sections here, sections one, two, and six to note that those are the sections that are consistent across all applications. You know, planning grants in particular, for instance, only get scored on sections one, two, and six. And so similarly for projects without physical improvements, so you're doing an energy conservation education program. Similarly, those would get scored on sections one, two, a little bit, a little bit of three and some of the other sections, but, but otherwise it's primarily one, two, and six. There's a handful of points elsewhere. Um, and then it's really the implementation projects, the projects um, that are being that are not planning grants, but they're implementing something that also has a physical improvement that, that gets scored in a majority of those sections. And so just so that we ground you all as you think about minimum scores, that not all sections are relevant, and there's some sections that are going to be relevant across all of them. Okay. All right. So again, purpose of minimum score is just to ensure that we're funding successful projects that align with PSAF goals and your guiding principles. A few different ways we can do this. We've talked about doing a minimum score on as a percentage of the overall score. Do they need to hit X percent of the entire score? Do we want to do a percentage of a score for any given section that, you know, they need to hit a certain minimum for the, in the organizational background and the social and environmental benefit sections or or do we want to do it just for um, a score in, 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 so we want, do we want to do a specific one for each section or do we want to do a score just for a, a handful of sections? The way we would conduct or implement a minimum score is that the initial scoring would be performed by two staff members. And that's in part to make sure that we know that one staff member sees something, another staff member sees something else. And so just to give that, um, just to give that a little, bring that, that rigor of two, two perspectives to every single application. And then we would also have an audit subcommittee that would be a, 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 a portion of the, the piece of committee. It could be three committee members that would be reviewing a sample of the projects that did not meet the minimum score um, in order to evaluate whether we need to tweak that process or make adjustments in the future. So just that's, that's the way at least, that's the way we would want folks to be thinking that as we do that, that it probably, you know, we would run it with two staff members and we would, we would recommend having an audit subcommittee. Next slide. These are some of the questions that came up last week. And so we've got more questions in a, in a couple more slides. And so as we, as we do this, I know that please feel free if there, as I'm gonna pause probably after this slide, maybe the next one and, and, and see if there are questions so as we get those content. Um, and if we wanna go on a breakout to discuss, we can, we can do that. Um, one of the questions that came out was just what are the mechanisms for transparency? And I'm just gonna read right here. It's just, you know, all applications that fail to meet the minimum score would be provided their scores with rationale and we propose that organizations led by priority populations would be invited to meet one-on-one -on -one and connect and, and it would staff as well as be connected to capacity building resources. We know that there's concern about priority community organizations um, being filtered out. And, we, and, and what we're suggesting, and I think a, a way, a proposal we have in order to address that, that we could bundle in, and it's gonna take a little bit more work to tease this out, is that if an applicant for a small or large grant implementation grant scores well in the organizational information section. So they're connected to their community. They have a good, a good history of organizing a particular community. They really understand a community, but you know, if they don't really score well elsewhere, then we would propose that we, ha we give them the opportunity that we, we reach out to them. We ask them, would they like to be considered for a planning grant instead? So recognize them, maybe it's the scope and other pieces that aren't quite there, but in order to accommodate some of that, 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 that that's one way in which we think we may be able to address that. And then the audit subcommittee, it's the who, what, and what happens. And so it'd be three committee members that, that are not on scoring panels is what we'd recommend, would, would score a sample of about 10 applications that do not meet the minimum score. And you know, if they disagree, they meet with the staff who score, discuss, calibrate those expectations and interpretations. And then we note those, we, we, and, and, and it's important to note, at this point, it'd really be an audit subcommittee to look back and say, okay, what did we miss? Did this work well? checking in on that, but it wouldn't be a process to change the scores. It would really function to say what's working, what's not working, and, and daylight improvements so that we can tweak that for the next round. 
So that's really, it would really be going back and act, after the fact, really auditing the process and saying, did we get this right? Do we need to make adjustments to how we do minimum scores? Do you want to pause for questions here, Sam? Yeah, good place. Mm -hmm. Before we get into some of the more numbers of what that could look like, yeah. Robin? Is this an opportunity for questions or for comments? Both. Um, okay, so I have, a, I guess, a couple of comments or, or thoughts. Um, I, I, I'd love to see something, a scoring kind of tied to PSAP mission relevancy, for lack of a better word, um, um, as, as some type of scoring criteria, and, and maybe this is the criteria that the two staff would initially do a, a review on. Um, so that's one thought. Uh, another thought is for the audit um, committee or subcommittee, um, you know, it, it would be nice if, if the timing can be worked out so that the, the audit committee, for, for, you know, reviews, for example, those that might be on the borderline of, of being kind of, you know, uh, filtered out and, and gives the audit committee some type of override, um, you know, just acknowledging that the system is not perfect. And, um, you know, the ones that might kind of fall between the cracks are the ones that are kind of the borderline ones. Um, so giving the audit committee an opportunity to do some type of override. Um, and then I think one thing about the, the concern about priority communities, uh, 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 community-led organizations being filtered out, um, I think it would be very helpful um, to provide some examples of projects from the last funding round. You could redact it and change it a little bit, uh, but give examples of projects that were not funded and provide an explanation as to, to why. And I think providing that feedback back to the community would be extremely valuable for them to, you know, even before they start putting together an application, you know, they can see, oh, this project that we were thinking about wasn't funded last year because of X, Y, and Z. Um, I think, you know, they would encourage them to rethink the project or take a, a different approach uh, to how they, they do it. So uh, those are some of my initial thoughts and comments. I'm, I might have more and I'll, I guess I'll email them. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Robin. Michael? I'd just like to add to Robbins that it would be, and I may have just missed this or it may have slipped my mind that I saw it and read it, but um, I would love to see a couple of examples of the feedback that you sent to organizations that we turned down or that didn't get grant funding last, last. I don't need to see them all, but you know, a couple samples would be great if we have not seen those yet. I think that we can certainly send the, sorry, Sam, I mean, we can certainly send the letters that we sent out to folks with feedback, but for organizations that were led by priority communities, we also had one-on-one -on -one in person meetings, or not in person, in virtual person meetings and um, follow up conversations, like at least one with those. So um, we might have some notes from that, but I don't know if we have, those were more conversational than kind of formal feedback, but we can definitely put, put together a couple of good examples if that would be helpful. Thank you very much. Megan? Yeah, thanks. This is uh, all the things you bring up, clarify more and I guess raise more questions. That's what we're here for. Um, I have two thoughts. Uh, one is just on the transparency idea. I really like that you're being really thoughtful about having some sort of transparency built in. And I wonder if also you could share the, um, the applications that don't meet a minimum score with reviewers somehow, not that we would review it, but more just like as part of a transparent process. I don't, like just thinking through that right now, I'm understanding that it's really just what happened over here and there'd be communication with the organization, but not by this whole group. So I'm just curious about that kind of additional transparency. And then the second bullet about um, suggesting an org be shifted to a planning grant. We definitely, I saw that possibility come up in my own reviewing last round where there were a couple of kind of would have been great planning grants. And I guess though it's not clear to me that would operationalize very easily because like just to slot that grant application over in the planning one, that 
that application might not score very well as a planning grant because they didn't write it like that. So I guess, I guess I just don't know, like I would love to hear more about how that would actually work. And, and I also think to Robin's point, if we were prioritizing priority led orgs, um, hopefully they wouldn't get filtered out. But I think on that specific thing that some projects just make better planning grants, they're not quite ready for implementation, having a plan for that is good. I'm just not sure it's as simple as just slotting them over in the planning grant. That's all I have for now. Thank you. I'll just note that um, it certainly would not be simple. And I think that we got as far as figuring out that we felt like we could definitely figure it out, but we haven't kind of nailed down all of those details because yeah, recognizing that the criteria is different, the application is different. It wouldn't be just as simple as reassigning it and its name. Faith and then Ramses. I um, just wanted to lift us out of the details for a moment and um, comment on the overall um, structure and the, the bringing this to us and also the framing you did, Sam, around why we would need minimum scores. I think that was really helpful framing. It feels critical to me that we have minimum scores. I don't want to be in a position of having to say yes to projects that don't meet the PSEF mission and our eligibility criteria are pretty you know, slim. Um, as, as you noted. And so I don't want us to be in a position that because we have $60 million, anything that, you know, any nonprofit in the city of Portland that applies gets the funding. Um, so I think it's really critical that in order to prioritize um, priority of communities and, and those investments that we do have a minimum threshold. So thank you for all of the thought from all the staff that went into this and, and to being responsive to last, the last meeting uh, comments as well. Um, one, I think, Robin, the way you raised it, I think this is just in reflection of that. You said, you know, it's great if we have something that 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 really flags for mission. Um, actually, I don't know how you said it. You said it so great, um, but that you know, if there was a score that points us to the relevancy, right, or how do, how well does it match the PSEF mission? And I think that's actually what the minimum score does, right, because it takes the application, which hopefully is representative of the mission of PSEF, right? It's that, that's the judgment call that we're making and that, that that gets us there. I do worry that having two staff members score every section of every application is uh, improbable, right? It's impossible rather, right? I, if we get 200 applications, it's two hours each, that's 400 hours. Do we have 10 plus weeks to review applications before they then get to the review panels? Um, for those on the for those on the edges, so maybe there's another way that we don't have to review every section, or there's, or maybe you guys have. I, I'm sure you've already thought about that, but that feels currently difficult. But I love the concept um, and appreciate the thought that's gone into it. It feels really important to me, and obviously the details matter greatly. And so I'm thankful we have all these great minds on here to figure that out and to push it and question it. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate all the comments thus far. Um, you know, I think um, on the suggestion of, you know, redirecting applicants from one grant to another grant, I think you just want to make sure folks are just careful on that. Like, I think my hope is as a program that we leave groups feeling empowered uh, and that we avoid being sort of a patronizing organization, if you will. So I think I just want to be sensitive to that because I think suggest making the call whether a group is ready for implementation grant or not. I think I think that's a tough call to say one group is ready or is more suitable for planning grant. Like I, I just want to sort of try to avoid that, that dynamic as best as we can. But I recognize it's coming from like I think really good good intentions here. Um, so I think I think there is a solution, um, but I think again my point here more is just the impact of the organizations. I think just avoid being sort of the perception of piece of being some um, you know uh, yeah uh, really wise or you know like that we know better. And I think I think we should just avoid that scenario um, as much as we can on what's where groups are at. And my my two cents on this is like. In some cases, we may never know unless we're talking directly to those groups. 
Um, so, and I think this might be just more of a longer term solution, um, but that's just my two cents on this. Um, I think I think any consideration of some kind of flexibility on balancing. So, you know, I know we have to get a certain amount of dollars out, but if we can create some kind of cushion knowing maybe there might be some kind of disparity that might allow us to sort of take a second look at some certain grants that just didn't meet the minimum scores. I don't know, I'm just spitballing at this point, but I think I think my first point I think still still kind of remains how however we, however we land. <laughs> Thank you all. Are we ready to move on to the next slide? Okay. Oh, I moved on two slides. I'll move back to just the next slide. And Sam, is this the slide that you wanted me to speak to? So, yeah, Sam, so, so yes. nice to me. <laughs> Sam gave me this slide, so this slide to speak to. So, this slide that has all the tables with the numbers on it. This was, and I, I was, so we'll make sure and follow up also with Jeffrey. This is in response to a question that Jeffrey raised in our small group conversation, just kind of really wanting to see like what percentage of projects score last time scored like above 70, which was kind of for us, what we felt like was like, that was a strong score. If you scored 70 out of a hundred points, then that was kind of, that was a strong score. Um, and then what about just 50 because like 50%, you know, who got half the points. And so that's what these tables speak to. So um, a couple of things I just want to like point out, I'm not going to read all of the numbers, um, but just want to point out and then maybe just give everybody a, a moment to just look at it is that this top, the top, um, the top table that says project type, those are implementation only. So those are just the small and large grants none of the planning grants. And the reason for that is because the planning grants were, there were just too many of them that were too early in their process to be able to be categorized, to, to, to know kind of like what the major funding area they were gonna fall into was. So we just sort of put planning grants into a different category. The table under it has all of the applications re reflected um, and separated out by grant type. So planning, small and large, and then just in a box to the side, these those numbers reflect are are just um, from applications, um, applicants that got a perfect score score on criteria three, meaning that more the majority of their um, staff, the majority of their staff leadership, and the majority of their board reflected the, the PSF priority population that their project was intended to serve. So um, just wanted to kind of like, I know that there is a lot of concern around um, culturally specific small organizations kind of falling through the cracks or that was one of the concerns that was raised related to minimum scores. Applicants that reflected the communities they served um, scored high, significantly high, scored higher than other applicants and not just in that criteria and not just in the organizational information category. They also scored higher overall in the project description in the project description and scope section than the sort of um, folks who did, who did not get a perfect score on criteria three. So just going to like stop talking and give folks a minute to look at all of the numbers and then see if there are any questions. I mean, this makes me feel good. And if we can get these kinds of numbers through our next RFP, I think I'll also feel pretty good about it, personally. So maybe just a couple of other things I would draw your attention to just to kind of keep in mind and know that 
we are kind of you know, as part of the evaluation process, like really looking at the um, some of the causes for the differences here. Um, is so just to note that kind of, um, that regenerative ag green infrastructure projects, you'll notice that only 38% scored above 70. So that's you know a, a chunk lower than workforce, which was the highest and um, had the highest percent of applicants that scored over 70. So that's a like that's a that's a pretty big disparity that we are kind of it didn't, doesn't have an um, an impact on outcome because we allocate by funding um, so by sort of funding area, but it is something that we are kind of making improvements to you know going to be recommending and making improvements to address. That's um, one, and then yeah, I think that that's kind of like the, the main the big the big pop out uh, from this is that, you know, folks that reflect the community they serve score score well across all sections. Um, the regenerative ag green infrastructure and um, workforce, those, the sort of the way in which those are score and the criteria that apply to them probably need to be adjusted a bit so that it's a little, they're a little bit more in line. And, um, and then I guess the only other thing would be that there, um, there is, you know, planning grants clearly were scored maybe just more gen generously. 80% of them got more than 70 points and, um, you know, which is pretty different than small and large at 50% got more than 70 points and 64% getting more than 70 points. I would also note, though, that uh, in pl planning grants is where we had, like, the largest sort of representation of um, as a percent of total of um, organizations that got a perfect score on criteria three. So there's some inter intersectionality going on there. Okay. I'm going to keep, unless there are any, this was really just in response to Jeffrey's question and kind of to help provide a little bit of assurance that um, if we did what we did last time, uh, those priority communities won't fall through the cracks. And now I'm going to pass it back to Sam. And so I think I'm going to read this slide, and then um, really there's there's just a couple more slides after this, but I think we'll move you all into I think my amazing move out the break. So I'll just you know you all just saw the slides before, so I think what we're well, what we're wanting you all to be thinking about is that we do that we set a minimum that an application must earn at least 50% of points in all sections that apply to them, with the exception of budget. And so, obviously, and so, um, and then, and then we, we, you know, we have this caveat, which it's going to take a little bit to work on. But if an applicant for an implementation grant has a strong scoring in their organizational information section, we can define what that is. That we be offer the opportunity to offer to for that applicant to be evaluated and scored as a planning grant. So there's still a little bit of working that idea out and and around this and coming back and thinking through just how does that ultimately land. But but at least that that be that 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 that's that's sort of what we will what, what you all what you all what we want you all to be thinking about. Um, you've all already the next slide is frankly the questions that you'll see on the next slide you've all already been answering and so um, what I think that we'll do, and I think it makes sense maybe, is to go to break and um, and then we'll come back and see whether we pick up here or whether we pick up on the threshold scores. So we're gonna take a five minute actual break. And then um, there will be 15 minutes where committee members will be moved into two, um, we can move you into two rooms tonight. Since Jeffrey's not here, but neither room will have a quorum. Um, and those are just rooms for committee members to get to know each other. Members of the public um, won't be won't be able to observe during this breakout session because it's just sort of a, a team building space. Um, but you can stay in the main room and um, after the five minute break, um, chat with staff or or with each other. Okay, it is what o'clock right now? Seven thirteen. So. Sorry, Sam, go ahead. And I was just going to also encourage if folks also just want to step away for that 20 minutes, feel free to do so too. So it's 7.13 right now. Um, and the we'll, so the break, the five-minute break will end at 
722, and then we will start the meeting back up um, 15 minutes after that. And I'll, we'll just give people in the breakout rooms a one minute warning. Okay, let's send them into the
Nice. Sweet. <laughs> James was the one doing the just to be clear though. <laughs> All right, welcome back everybody. I um, hope you've had some good conversations in your breakout. Um, we wanted to, I think, just offer a suggestion. I think we wanted to kind of go back maybe to um, these, these, slot, um, these questions that were about, that were kind of related to the conversation about minimum score and see if there were any kind of comments or questions or things that folks wanted to say to close out that conversation. And then we wanted to suggest that we actually kind of skip the threshold review conversation so that we have time to um, talk about the, to sort of get into the innovation slash other um, funding area um, deliberate presentation and deliberation tonight. And then if there's time at the end of the night, we can return to the threshold review conversation. If not, we'll pick it back up um, later. Does that feel like it works for everyone? Okay. Not hearing any objection. I just wanted to, so everyone should be able to see, these are, these are the questions. And I do feel like, you know, the um, comments and the questions that were offered um, addressed a lot of these, but I wanted to, um, you know, make sure that all committee members um, felt like they had a chance to ask questions or make comments related to minimum score um, to before we move on. Also, just noting that you can always reach out later if something occurs to you or if you're more comfortable sort of um, talking with, with um, staff or co-chairs individually. Okay, well, with that magic, I think it looks like we are back on schedule. And I will turn it back over to Sam to um, provide some context around the um, innovation conversation. Okay, <clears throat> so the innovation funding category, it was the catch-all in a sense, and, and yet there it's, it's called innovation and many other things. So there's there's a lot that I think that, that came through this last round. And so I'm going to start with just reading the code definition, the definition that came, that lives within the code around what this category is. And it says that this category, this is 5% of the fund, is intended to provide the committee with flexibility to fund a project that does not directly fall under one of the other categories but which provides an opportunity to further the goals of this chapter, chapter being the PSEF program. And so it's, it can be many things. And I think that it's, it's really, as we saw in the first round, and I'm gonna talk through some of these, I'll just read through these bullets in a minute, but we got many different applications. And so I think what we saw is there's probably, there, there, there's, there's a few directions we can go in terms of providing clarity to applicants so they get a better sense for, for the kind of projects that that, that will work, but so that they can just for their own planning purposes have some 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 direction and, and, and some guidance. Um, this of, of all the funding categories, this category received about requested about 5.5 million in funding requests. And there's a table we looked at when you all were making your portfolio decisions last go around. But if you looked at this category, you know, I think generally speaking, when we looked at a lot of the other categories, we saw a, a strong level of interest that aligned with the amount of funding for that category. It was relatively proportional for most of the categories. This category received a lot of interest. And so I think it's just there, there's a, there's the, given the wide level of projects that came through, um, starting to provide more clarity is, is gonna be something you wanna consider. So what we'll share is what we can, what we, what we have in this category is about 14 implementation grants, roughly half small, half large, requesting 5.5 million in total of, of, of last, of, of in, in the last round. So. Um, as we think about 5%, 5% of 60 million is about $3 million. And so 
even in the last round, we've received more, you know, a greater funding request than what, what, what we'll have to give in the next round. So just, just to keep some of those figures in mind. Now you can, well, let me, let me, let me keep going through this. The average request is just about $390,000. Now we did receive three large grant requests about a million dollars, two of them were transportation projects and one of them was a leadership development project. It included transportation projects in this category, requests for a building purchase for a community space, curriculum development, use of new technologies, theater production, planning for land use and educational spaces, trash collection and leadership development. And we think that some of the applications could have applied really under different categories. For instance, the leadership development could have very well applied under work, workforce con training and contractor support. And that'll be some of the conversation we have next week. Now, average score for these projects was about 57.10. And the small, and this was in this category, the smallest percentage of, of projects that scored above a 70. So only 36% of the projects scored above 70. Um, and a little over 40% of the applicants in this category got a perfect score for reflecting the communities, uh, the communities that they intend to serve lower than the overall pool. And so as we think about this, this next round, generally to, uh, when we think about guidance, if that's what we're gonna provide some of those target ranges, it'd be really in about the $3 million range for, for this funding area. And certainly when we come get projects in, you can always go above that or whatever else for a given year because you've got a really great project, but recognizing on a three-year basis, you're gonna need to average out to, 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 to about 5% you know, level. And so it means, Sure, next round, you, you put out a target of $3 million, you fund $4 million because you've got a great project, but it means in the following next year, you may end up only be funding $2 million in order to ultimately bring it in closer alignment. So just wanted to share some of that with you all as, as, you, as you think about this category. Um, and so we've got a handful of questions for you all to think about in the next slide, and then we'll send you all into, um, into what we hope is discussion discussion breakout rooms to, to talk about these questions, but I want to just, um, and I'll just go through those. You know, we want you to think about, imagine the kind of ideal projects that this funding area should support. You know, code language is, this is something we wrestled with within the team. It defines innovation in a way that isn't really alignment with a common understanding of the word. So just think about how do you all understand that word? You know, innovation should receive about 5% of the funding total. And so given that it's a smaller funding level overall, um, you know, should the innovation funding only above be allowed for smaller planning grants, effectively capping it at five hundred thousand dollars? So, and that's the that's the new small grant cap that, that we proposed like a few meetings ago. So, when it's, we're putting that out there because, you know, depending given that it's only three million dollars or so available in this category, that would you want one singular project to come in at three million and 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 and, and and have all the project up. So that's where we were just like, given given the variety of project proposals you saw, is there is there in the same way that we sort of landed at a million dollars for $8.6 million funding round, is there a desire to potentially um, be able to send a signal that small grant cap is what you'd like to see here so that you could do several different projects. And so and that relates to some of the question that, um, the, the, the comment that Anissa raised earlier around their, 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 their suggestion or their, their desire to see a larger grant cap there. Um, now, PSEF projects in other categories, we, we, we require them to use technologies that are commercially available. And so is this the space where you want to see that research and development and really innovation in the traditional sense? Is this where you want to see those projects? And then for you know, things you want to think about, given, again, that transportation doesn't really, for now, at least it falls here, you know, applicants interested in transportation projects need guidance on how they fit in the program. Would you want to allocate 50% of the innovation funding area, so 1.5 million to transportation projects and send that kind of set. This is what we this is where we see those projects. So um just those are some of the questions that we some of the questions and others I know that, that are coming up for you all we certainly encourage, but um wanted to wanted to pose those for you all and, and, and ultimately send you all in the breakout groups to discuss. But before we we do that, it'd be great just to see Questions people have about either the prior slide, about this category, how it relates to the, maybe about in relation, maybe the other funding areas, um, just any questions that, that folks have um, that, 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 that you want to ask either with the whole group or, or to staff before we send you all the breakouts.
Um, can I see the slide prior to this just one more time before we go into the breakout, please? Yeah, well, we'll sit here for a little bit because I think there's a, there's a lot there in those bullets down low um, around these, the, the projects that came through and, and so on. Thank you. And, and, and just as for folks, when we do go out into this next breakout group, because these are discussions around around you know getting your thoughts, we will be we will be taking notes in these next breakout groups. Okay, are folks ready to go into breakout groups then? Right, and maybe just one more note on the breakout groups. This is um, the the public will be um, public members of the public will be able to enter those breakout groups, um, but you'll need to drive yourself there. So you'll see um, when James kind of sends committee members into breakout groups, you should see a little box with boxes inside of it. And if you click on that, then there should be a pop-up window if it doesn't pop up automatically and you should be able to join a breakout, whichever breakout group you want to. And you also should be able to leave it and then join a different breakout group sort of during the 15 minutes that breakouts are happening. Um, these breakouts also have note takers, Janet and Jay are gonna be in there. And just in case folks didn't notice the questions, um, the questions that we posed on on the um, on the slides, uh, not on the slide, but the one that follows it, um, are copied into the chat. And for committee members, obviously, if there are other questions you feel like should be, you know, asked and answered, you know, please just raise those in in the breakout or 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 with us. All right, James, are you ready to? Move, move people around.
um, we have about we have about at sort of nine minutes before committee member comments, and so I just wanted to invite um, anyone. Oh, I'm, actually, you know what? I'm just going to turn off the slideshow if that works for everyone, because I don't think that we need it anymore. Um, Sam, is that okay? Totally, it's okay. off. I was going to say that you're not sharing right now, anyways. Yep. Oh, oh, right, because we were in the breakout room. I forgot about that. Um, so, I just wanted to ask if there was if if folks wanted to share some of um, kind of some of the things that came up in the discussion in the breakout rooms, and then um, in the next handful of minutes, and then um, move on to closing comments. Sam, I'm, maybe I'll call on the group that you were in because we got the very end of a com of that conversation as we were all coming back into the main room. Um, there. I, I, I'll, I'll share this comment and encourage others that were sharing there to, 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 to share. I'll just share this comment that Robin shared. Now, it was a question I have for the group for folks to think about. Robin said, innovation, should, innovation, shouldn't, should, innovation or funding areas shouldn't just be about funding technology or innovative technologies. It should be about funding innovative models. And what I wanted to push and, and, and ask about there was just, we talk a lot about creating room for groups to do things differently. Um, and so do you not, I wanted to push Robin and say, do you not see that in, if, if a clean energy project was approach, it was, was approaching a, a solar installation or ductless heat pump project, but it was doing it in a different model, would that, would that, fall into the clean energy funding area or would that fall under the innovation area? So maybe just to push on how we define different models or different ways of doing things. So that's, that's, that's all that, that came up as we thought as, as, as in the conversation around um, because it was a rich conversation. So I'd like to put back to others though. You want me to respond or just let that soak in? <laughs> yes? Uh, okay, I think that's a yes. I I'll just make it quick. I think it's you know it's about risk. I think if you're going to uh, support innovative business models or delivery models, you have to be willing to accept risk and accept failure. Um, and I think uh, yes, you can still classify that project under a different category. But I think the 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 scoring system right now, as it stands, I think it biases against risk. So. Uh, if you rate this with all the other projects that are in this category, I think the chances of it getting awarded will be less because it, it's riskier. Whereas if you have something that's focused on innovation, that's more tolerant for risk, there's a more likelihood that that project will be funded. Yeah, and just to, I think quickly round out the conversation that, you know, we did discuss whether innovation should be funding transportation projects or infrastructure projects, yes or no. I think there's a good lively discussion on, on that. Uh, I think maybe there was some maybe consensus around maybe not capping it to just 50% of innovation fund. You know, like I think, I think uh, we heard from others, like maybe there's just other great innovation projects outside of transportation, so wouldn't want to limit that. Um, you know, I know we sort of even discussed whether transportation should just be limited to to um, innovation. But um, you know, I think I think you know one other topic you know that we just had was just like um, the role of just PSIF in general to disrupt public institutions that should be funding this work. Um, and so I think is, is there a way for is that the role for PSIF, um, knowing that we might see multiple investments from federal action or state action in our local regions and is there a way for peace to play a role in making sure that, that, that those funds are being equitably distributed um, that are addressing the key buckets within, within PSEF? Um, I think it's more of an open question, no real like clarity, but I think it's just part of our lively discussion on, on that topic. And um, yeah, I'll uh, pause there. I don't know if I missed anything. Megan or Michael, you have anything to add? Nope. Right. Well, maybe I can, um, I will start by just a, with a little 
kind of j- some highlights from the group that I was sitting in on, which was Maria, Amanda, Faith, and Shanice, and um, maybe just start by highlighting or asking Faith to sort of repeat or speak to kind of what we call that category. Um, I think that we were really thinking uh, that the group that I was sitting in, that was really sort of talking about innovation, um, not the way that we commonly understand the word and, and sort of, and talking about maybe calling it something different. So, um, and then there were a lot of great ideas about kind of what, um, what a, what people would like to see funded in this area. Yeah, I think you summarized it really well, Katie, but it, it seems really contrary to what the other group talked about. Um, it sounds like, Robin, you were really interested in innovation as something that was, by definition, riskier, right? I mean, that's that's what innovation means. It means you're trying something. And when um, Sam, when you included on there, or when the staff, you included um, the language from the code around what this bucket was supposed to entail, to me, it doesn't say innovation at all. So it was it's the other bucket. And I think if that's the intention and that's what we want to support, we should be kind of, we should come up with a, a additional supplementary language that helps people see themselves in that. That's not just innovation in the traditional sense of risky new projects, but projects that are different that don't fit squarely underneath one of the other categories like transportation. That doesn't necessarily mean inv- innovation. So to me, if that's what our intent is, it's kind of important to start talking. Language is important, so it's important to start talking about it in a more expansive way, if that's what we mean. And then the group had lots of great ideas on what that more expansive projects could look like. So I'm sure they're out there, too. Maria, did you want to offer some thoughts about the conversation? Sure. We talked a little bit about some ideal projects, and um, we're really curious about what are the boundaries of PISA to uh, support uh, really intentional policy making, organizing, coalition building and lobbying, um, and where does that fit into this work, and could that qualify as innovation, as well as, you know, trying to provide resources to folks so that their basic needs are met, food, water, shelter, electricity, um, is there potential for really big mutual aid kind of work through what PSEF is is funding? Thanks, Maria. Amanda or Shanice, did you want to add anything? No, I think um, it was all covered well. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. All right. On this 820, Sam, did you want to, was there anything else you wanted to note or say before we move to Committee member comments. Just, just that um, I appreciate the conversation. I think this, this gives us a lot of this, this, this gives us a lot of different feedback to work with, and um, certainly both in terms of just thinking around the, the the different types of projects that we could support, as well as the the, the thinking through of risk. And it's going to come back to, and I think part of just our thinking around how, what, what you know when we when we come back to portfolios, what, what might that look like? So I think. There's a, there's a lot, this has given us a lot of pieces to, to think about and just to appreciate the conversation, appreciate you all jumping into it so, uh, so actively. All right, so are there any committee member comments to close out the meeting? We all just in our houses, sort of sitting still, actively sweating because it's 85 degrees outside. <laughs> um, Except for Michael. All right. Well, 
Except for Michael, who has solar <laughs> and doesn't feel bad about air conditioning. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think that we agreed last time not to, um, not to uh, ask grand fees to um, lead us in a, cl a closing exercise until we're in person again. So um, unless there is anything else, I think we could actually just bow out a few minutes early. All right. Thank you all. And thank you all members of the public for coming and, and listening in and um, providing input and have a good night. <laughs>